Father, thank you so much for the time we can be here tonight. Thank you for each one that's come here tonight, Lord. I pray a real blessing over each one of us as we're here to hear what you have to say to us, your bride, your church. So open our eyes, I pray, open our hearts, and help us to obey what you speak to us this evening. We'll give you praise and all glory for everything that you're going to do in our lives, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You could be seated. Thank you all for being here. First uh, John chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 1. We're just about through First John. Brother, thank you for bringing the spirit of praise and worship in here tonight. Thank you. Um, so we finished the book of Galatians in, uh, on Wednesday night. So Wednesday nights, we're going to start the book of Ephesians. We're just going to go right through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And then here in 1 John, when we're done with 1 John, we're going to go to 2 John, 3 John, and then Jude. Uh, Lord willing, because if we get raptured next week, we won't have to worry about any of that. But, uh, but Lord willing, we'll, we'll have plans to go our way unless God changes that. Okay, let's take a look at 1 John chapter 5. I want to do the first nine verses. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begat also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and by blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Unfortunately, some Bible versions leave that verse out. They say there's three that bear record in heaven, but they leave out the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Well, why would you leave out the Trinity? Amen? Okay, verse 8. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree as one. So if we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. So I want to go back to verse 1. I was sent a video this week, and I'm, I think David uh, Strait had sent it to me, but I'm not sure. But it was a, a person who was preaching that Jesus is not God. And it was like, oh man. So I, I put some scriptures uh, in the comment section on that YouTube. And then at the end, I couldn't resist. I put, duh, you know. <laughs> and people started liking my comment. So again, the way we fight evil, the way we dispel the, the lies is by speaking the truth. We just give them the truth. We don't want to get into a, a, a concerted argument with anyone. The Bible says the servant of the Lord must not strive or argue. We just simply give them the truth. If they reject the truth, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the Lord. Amen? So in verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah or the anointed one or the sent one is born of God. And this we also love those whom the Lord has saved as well. What God is plainly saying there, if we love him, we're going to love each other. Because he lives in you and in me. So if we love the Lord, and, and you know what's interesting, because sometimes I'll have a complete stranger that I'll meet, and I'll, and I'll sense that they're a Christian. And we'll just hit it off, and connect right away, and either I'll say it first or they will, and they'll say, you know, I'm attracted to the Lord in you. And that's so true. It's the same Holy Spirit that abides with us. He lives in us and attracts us to each other because of who he is. Amen? It's not a flesh thing. It's a spirit thing. So John chapter 1. 
And I know you're all familiar with this because we did study the book of John. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, well, verse 11 says, He came unto his own, that's Jesus came to his own people, the Jews, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And again, I just want to stress that word believe is not a mental ascension, it's a heart trust. So the word believe, pistevo, means to totally, completely rely upon. So what that verse is really saying is, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who completely and utterly trust in his name. Verse 13, those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God, or they were born again. Amen? So let's take a look at John 15, John chapter 15, to kind of further explain that. John 15, 9 through 12. Again, we can be born by the will of man. Somebody can say, hey, if you'll fill out this paper, and if you'll believe our list of beliefs here, you're a Christian. Well, that's not true. Any more than I can walk into Dan's garage and become a, a, a Plymouth or a Dodge. I can't do that. So we have to understand that only by being born again. It's not by rules, not by regulations, only by God's Spirit. John 15, verse 9. And I share some of that because I know most all of you, if not all of you, already know that. But people are listening on YouTube as well. And there's people that have checked into our channel that said, man, I never knew this before. And they've left comments, you know. So it's so important, even though you know it and I know it, it's good to hear it again. John 15 and verse 9. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you, Jesus said. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, and what were his commandments? Number one, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number two, to love our neighbors ourself. So, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, I've written to you, or I've spoken these things to you that my joy may remain in you so that your joy may be full. Now, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So, how did God love us? Well, unconditionally. Jeremiah 31 3 says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. I won't even ask for raised hands on this one, but I believe that almost every one of us in here has been offended by someone who's a Christian, either in church, a pastor or a sister or a brother in the Lord. It's just the way it is because we're humans. Sometimes we open mouth before <laughs> engaging brain, and we have to. It's an opportunity for us to forgive one another. Okay, the, you know, Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended in me. So let me add to that, blessed are those who are not offended with someone else either and what we might say in the Lord. Because God says we have to forgive. You remember what he said? If you don't forgive every one of your brothers from your heart, neither will my Father forgive you. So this is a command of God's and we have to keep that. Sometimes that's not as easy as it sounds. But if we make the decision to hand that offense over to the Lord, let him take care of it, that's called forgiveness. We can move forward with our walk with the Lord. Restoration can come if God reaches that person, that person's open to be reached, and they repent. Now you can restore that relationship. God never said you had to go back for seconds. He didn't. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Notice in Scripture, he didn't go to Pilate. He didn't go to the Roman soldiers. He didn't go and tell them everything's just fine. But he left the opportunity open for them to come to him. And so in verse 2 and 3, the scripture says when we love God, we love his children as well, and we keep his commandments. And again, those commandments are to love him and to love each other. So let's take, and by the way, I really like, someone said that in here recently, and I really liked it. Uh, besides love not being a feeling, 
Love is, I think it was Dan. Dan said that this morning. Sometimes love is sharpening one another. Sometimes it can be a rebuke. That's love. If you really love someone, you'll tell them the truth. So let's take a look at John 14 and verse 15. You were in John 15, so just turn the page back one. John 14 and verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John 14, 21, the Lord says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will show myself to him. And then in John 14, 23, the scripture says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, they'll keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We can say a lot of things with our mouth, God isn't talking about what we're saying. God's talking about what we're doing. Amen? Keeping his commands aren't speaking. It's actually following him, obeying him. And that's one of the very first things he said to all the different disciples that he called. He just said, follow me. Told that to Andrew. Told that to Peter. Told that to John. Follow me. So God wants us to follow him. Verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Scripture says, whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and our faith is the victory. Sometimes it may feel like the world is running over you. It may feel like there's more of them than there is of us. It's not true. What's really going on here is those who scream the loudest get the most attention. And it's the minority that's screaming the loudest. They're not the majority. They're the minority. Okay? So we have already overcome them by the blood and by the word of our testimony. We need to just continue to go forward in that. John 16 and verse 33. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. Be of good cheer. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. We're going to have troubles. That's, you know, I used to uh, take statements up at one of the local prisons in San Luis County. And once in a while I would get an officer that was just falling apart. And he'd say, they, they threw this at me. And then they said this to me. And then they threatened my family. And they did this and I did that. And I would listen to them and take down their statement. But one time I decided to step out there a little bit and get somebody back into reality. And I said, you know what? You signed up for this. You know, this is a prison. You know, bad people are here. <laughs> and you can expect that when you signed up for this, this is what's going to happen. No one's going to treat you nicely. They're angry because they're in prison. So they're going to take out their anger on you. You signed up for this. It's kind of like being a police officer. You signed up to be disrespected, cussed at, yelled at, screamed at, whatever. And so as Christians, we signed up to be like our Savior. He said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. We can't take that personally because people are not angry with us. They're angry with God. And when they hear the truth, it's not about us. It's about the Lord. It's about the Lord. I've had people so angry at me, they, they said to me, You think you're God? <laughs> I tell them, Nope, I'm just a spokesman for the Lord. I'm just telling you what he said. Well, you act like you're always right. I said, No, I'm never right, but God's always right. Let God be true and every man a liar. This is what God says. I'm going with that. I'm going with the fact that God's word is truth. People really get angry. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that we have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. We already have it. Robert, we already own it. We have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's our part? The next verse, verse 58. God tells us to be steadfast, to be unmovable, to always abound in the work of the Lord because we know already that our labor is not in vain if it's in the Lord. 
If we're doing this for Jesus, our labor isn't in vain. If you see some homeless person and they're hungry and you stop to minister to them and share the gospel for them, you have not lost your reward. And I know you don't do it for a reward. I don't do it for a reward. But God is so gracious, he will reward us for doing those things. We're to be steadfast and unmovable. Talk to someone who today who was a little bit concerned about putting one of their children in a secular school. So when I raised my daughter Christina, she went to Christian preschool at one of the local churches here, and then when she got in the first grade, I put her in a, a bigger church uh, Christian school. And after sixth grade, she said, Dad, I think I'd really like to go to a regular school. And at that time, they didn't have Christian junior high. So I said, okay, and I prayed about it, and the Lord had me put her in one of our junior highs here. And she did really, really well. And I thought it was a really wonderful balance that she had that, she had that foundation. She loved Jesus with all of her heart. But honestly, church, how are we going to win the world if we're always in church? We have to go out into the world and spread the gospel. And I think one of my biggest fears, as is most parents, is she's going to get corrupted. They're going to teach her that there is no God, that creation isn't real, the two rocks hit together, etc., etc. Well, let me just use my brother David's example. His son goes to the same uh, school, elementary school, that both my grandkids go to. And uh, they have some great teachers. They have Christian teachers there. Not everybody's a believer, but that's why our kids are there to share Jesus with those who aren't. They're solid. They're, they're, they're rooted. They're grounded. They already have that belief system in them. They're born again. Nobody's going to change them. Remember what Jesus said? No one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand because I and my Father are one. Nobody's going to steal us or our belief system. Now I get it. I get it. Some high schoolers, after they graduate, they go to college and their mind gets twisted and their professors are anti-God, anti-country, and they turn them around. But honestly, if we've trained them up in the way they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. I really uh, admire Dan and Patty Demeter for not only adopting their grandchildren, but raising them in the Lord. And those children are solid. They get Bible devotions. They, they, they get prayed for. They get taught the Bible. And they get the example lived in front of them. That's all we can do. We cannot protect our children from what's out there. We have to trust God to protect them while they're out there. Amen? We, you know, we live in a fallen world. And God wants us to be lights out in a, in a fallen world. That's what he wants. So, in verse 5, we're told that who is he who overcomes the world? Well, he who believes that Jesus is the Christ or the Son of God. We're the ones that overcome the world because we already have the truth in our heart. We believe. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. Because those fears are very real. I mean, I had all these suspicions about sending my daughter to a secular high school. Oh, man, there's drugs there. There's crazies there. That, you know, I prayed and prayed for her, and you know what? She got involved in athletics programs. She got involved in the drama uh, uh, class there and really became quite the thespian. <laughs> and she flew through there with, uh, with really good grades, got out, was motivated, started one business and started another business. She's very successful. She had the right foundation. You know what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians. No other foundation, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us that. No other foundation can any man lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So let every man take heed how he builds upon that foundation. Now it is true, we can build wood, hay, and stubble. But we can also build gold, silver, and precious stones. Amen? So at some point, we really have to look to the Lord and say, Father, at some point my child is going to be in the world. Man, I'll, I can't even tell you how hard it was. I was a single dad from the time my daughter was four 
when she turned 18, she wanted to get out of the house and have her own house. It was like, wait, wait, did I do something wrong? No, it's not about that, Dad. I need to grow up and go now. And it, it was like, you know, it was hard for me. And I would wait for her to call me at night and say I'm lonely, and she never did. <laughs> the only one time she called me, she said, I think there's someone outside my house, Dad. Can you come? And man, I was down there in about 10 minutes and looked all around the neighborhood. I couldn't find anybody, but that was it. And she's been on her own ever since, and she's become a success. I had to trust God with that. We have to trust God with our children. We have to know. Samuel, while you're in school there, uh, I forget the name of the Down the Dip school, but my grandkids go there too. What's it called? Pine Grove. Pine Grove. Amen. There's a lot of Christian kids there. And there's some Christian teachers there. I've met them. And uh, Samuel actually got in trouble for witnessing to somebody. <laughs> so... Yeah, that was another student. Yeah, he got, he, he, he got in uh, some, some trouble for that. But you know what? God rescued him anyway. And you know what? If we're not the salt of the earth, what are we? <laughs> Amen? I mean, I've had people question me. In fact, I had a guy that used to attend my Bible study that said, you know what, man? You're in a cult. And I said, what? And he said, the black sheep motorcycle ministry, I've looked it up online. It's a cult. And I said, brother, you didn't look up the ministry I'm involved in. We are a soul winning motorcycle riding group. And our whole heartbeat is to bring these lost bikers that will never come to church to bring them to Jesus. That's our whole ministry is to bring people to Christ. And he got so adamant about him. I just told him, you know what, you're wrong. You, uh, you don't understand our heart. How can you judge something when you don't even know our heart? You don't even know. You've never been around us. You've never seen us operate. I wish he would have been at the funeral I did three weeks ago. A hundred outlaw bikers standing by Lopez Lake. And I got to stand in front of them all and share the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only were they blessed, I had the vice president of that one of the clubs and the president of another club that one your son used to belong to, Sandra, come up to me and shake my hand and said, man, we so loved having you there at that funeral. That was awesome. You keep doing that. So people are hungry. They need the Lord. And we really need to be the salt of the earth and reach out to him. So who, who is he that overcomes the world? He that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We've already overcome it. We have nothing to fear. Romans 8, verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. In other words, you're not my judge. I'm not your judge. So how can you bring a charge against me? How can, how can I bring a charge against you? I'm not the judge. I don't have nail holes in my hands. Jesus is our judge. Now the Bible does say he came not to judge the world, but to save the world. But we do have one that judges us, and that is the word which he has spoken. That will be our judge in the last day. So we can look in the word of God and instruct someone, but we still can't make the final judgment. That's up to the person's heart and the Lord. Amen. It's a personal relationship. So in verse 34, he says, Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died. And furthermore, he is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, or outlaw bikers, or a secular school, or a secular college, or people who disagree with us. No, nothing's going to separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As it is written, for your sake, Lord, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, how many? All of them. All of these things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're more than conquerors. You ever been put down by someone because you tried to witness to them? Of course. It's part, part of the calling. Yeah, not everyone 
Who even says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he that does the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is to believe on him whom he has sent. So not every, there's a lot of people that say, Lord, Lord, but have they really believed Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God himself, God the Son. So let's take a look at verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then Paul said this. Now, look, there's some things that I can waffle on. You know, there's some Christians that are just adamant, wrong for women to wear makeup. My theology is if the barn needs painting, paint it. Okay. <laughs> There's some people that say women should only wear a dress. You're majoring on minors, and you're going to cause more issues with that kind of preaching than if you will just let the Holy Spirit work in people's lives. So what do we do? We trust God to lead us and to lead others. Now, if someone comes to me and says, hey, you know, I'm involved in this criminal activity. What does God have to say? I will be happy to open up the Bible and say, this is everything God has to say about thievery, about lying, about criminal activity. You'll be judged for it. But I'm not going to go to them if I think they're involved in it. If God hasn't told me to go, God first tells me to pray. And then I wait for the Holy Spirit to work. And usually, people will come to you. God will draw them to you. He will. He'll draw them to you and they'll ask you questions. What does God think about this? Revelation, or excuse me, Romans 8, verse 38 and 39, Paul says, I'm persuaded. Now, there's some things I'm persuaded about and I'm not going to move. I'm persuaded about the virgin birth. I am persuaded about the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I am persuaded that it's only the blood. I am persuaded that the Holy Spirit is God, Jesus is God, and the Father is God. I will not move on any of that. I am persuaded. I'm persuaded that you must be born again. As far as should you cut your hair, that's between you and the Lord. You know, I, I think people major on minors sometimes and they just cause all kinds of confusion. Don't major on minors, major on majors. Keep the main thing the main thing, amen? The main thing the main thing. So Paul said, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present or things to come, not height or depth or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I got the coolest text this week, you guys. I have been praying for this brother in Christ for 34 years. 34. And he got offended by someone in church. Uh, they said something that they shouldn't have said to him. He dropped out of church and started drinking. And the drinking became alcoholism. And I've talked to him. I've prayed with him. I've rebuked him. I've sent him to places where he can get rehabilitated. All this stuff. And nothing worked. So finally I tried the last thing, which is no fellowship. It's what the Bible says. If any man that you know is a fornicator, an adulterer, a drunkard, etc., have no company with him. Don't even eat with him. So as hard as it was, this guy's my friend. I love him. He's, he's my good brother in the Lord. Yeah, I know he went sideways, haven't we all? So I tried that part. And that part worked. After about three months, I get a text saying, thank you for praying for me. I really appreciate you loving me all these years. I just wanted you to rejoice with me that I am at 100 days without a drink. 100. So the next day, I invited him to go out to the ranch with me, and we spent some time out there. And he looked much better. He his mind has come back. He, he knows he needs to pursue the Lord now. And I thank God for his miracles like that. God is able. I don't care how far someone has slipped. God is able. Paul said, look, and this is the way it reads in the Greek. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. I am persuaded that neither nothing in dying, nothing in living, 
not any kind of angels or principalities or powers. Nothing that's happening in your life right now, nor things that will happen in the future. Not anything high or anything low, or maybe even low down. Neither any other created thing will be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. Nothing. Because God will love me with an everlasting love, and he will love you with an everlasting love, and it doesn't matter how far our own children go, do we not love them? Do we not pray for them? We've been involved in prayer for I don't know how many years for Sandra's son. Years and years. I mean, I know she's been praying since he was a little boy. But he's in his 60s now, right? 61. Finally came to the Lord. Finally is walking with Jesus. Doesn't matter how long. And it doesn't matter how far. Because what did he say? Nothing high, nothing low. No other creature. No kind of angels, whether good ones or bad ones. Nothing in living, nothing in dying, nor, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's a good definition of everlasting love. It never changes. Amen. Verse 6. This one was a little bit... Oh, let me try one more verse on, on overcoming the world. Revelation 12, 11. How do we do that? The Bible says we've overcome the world by number one, the blood of the Lamb. Number two, by the word of our testimony. Our testimony is very powerful. God saved us. We were lost and in sin. We were blind and now we see and we're saved. So our testimony, when you tell someone, nobody's going to argue with you about your testimony. This is where I was and this is what God did for me. That's my story. Nobody's going to argue with your story. So we have the the victory through Jesus' blood and through our story. That's where we have it. Verse 6 says, Jesus came by water and by blood. Now you can take that two different ways. Okay? He came by the natural birth and then he came by a spiritual blood which was from the Holy Spirit. Okay? Or you can take it this way. When they stabbed him in the side on the cross out came water and blood. So I, I wanted to look at that in two different ways to see if there were any other scriptures that kind of backed that up. So let's take a look at several here. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And this will kind of help us understand what does it mean by water and by blood. Isaiah 7 and 14 says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign you know that guy that always says, here's your sign? The Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name God with us, Emmanuel. So, how does a virgin conceive? By the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at that. Luke chapter 1. Exactly how does that happen? Well, here's how it happens. Luke chapter 1. Verses 31 through 35. So an angel came to Mary, you know, in front of this story, and said, Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. Behold, Verse 31, you will conceive in your womb and you will bring forth a son and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now if you've studied at all the scriptures in Isaiah, the scripture says when the throne of David is taken over. It's going to be by the Messiah. And it will be forever. There will never be an end to that kingdom. Ever, ever, ever. Never be an end. So in verse 32, he will be great. And he will take the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
and of his kingdom there will be no end. That We're talking eternal now. Okay? So this thing, Mary, that's going to be born in you is eternal. Verse 34. Mary said to the angel, good question, how can this be since I've never been intimate with a man? I've never known a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So that's God's seed. That's God's seed. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. It's only happened once in history and that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. God came from heaven to earth. Okay, and then we want to go to John chapter 19 to cover the other part of the story. John chapter 19. It's really good to study these things out because sometimes we can read it over and go, man, what does that mean? Well, forget it. That's, you know, too much. But if we study it out, God has an answer for everything in Scripture. There's an answer. And those things that don't have an answer are called a mystery. We're not uh, intended to know those things. We're intended to believe those things. Amen. So in John 19, verse 30, the scripture says, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. So here we have a picture of Jesus on the cross. It's his last moments. And he says the Greek word, and boy, this word means a lot, if you knew what it meant in the Greek. In the English, it's, he said, it is finished. Well, that's almost like an American parent saying, I'm going to count to three. No. No, it didn't even count to one. Teleoste, the, the Greek word teleoste means it is completed. There's nothing else you can add. Leave it alone. It is finished. I've heard preaching like this. If Jesus went into hell and wrestled the devil and took the keys... Jesus always had the keys. Yes, he went into the center of the earth. He never went to hell. The Bible says in Psalm 16, 9, or 16, 10, his body will see no corruption. If he would have went to hell, he would have been corrupted. He didn't go to hell. He went to paradise. Hell was across the street, across the canyon. He went to paradise. He didn't wrestle the devil. Jesus always had the keys. And so the scripture here in John 19, Jesus on the cross, he receives the sour wine and says, Teleoste, there's nothing else you can add to this. I don't have to go to the center of the earth and wrestle anybody. I don't have to fight anybody. It is done. It's finished. It's over. And then he gave up the ghost. Verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that he would break their legs, that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first one and of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Why didn't they do that? Because Psalm 22 says, not a bone of him was broken. Period. Now, isn't that interesting? They broke the legs of the first thief. They broke the legs of the second thief. But they never touched Jesus' bones. Someone said to me, you know, an educated person said to me, well, it's impossible if they would have driven a nail through his hands. He, they would have broke some of those, met, I think they're called metac metacarpal bones in your hand. There's a lot of them in there. I said, well, because you don't know the Greek, you don't know what the hand means. The hand in Greek is the Greek word hiere, and it's from here to there. This is your hand. This is your arm up here. This is your hand. So when they put the nails through his hand, they put them through those two bones right there where it can hold, and there's a, there's a joint there where it doesn't slip. If they would have put it through his hand, it would have ripped through his hands. They put it through here, which in the Greek, your hand is 18 inches. It's a cubit. It's from here to here, and they put the nails there. This is your arm. So, he didn't like that either, whatever. John 19, I mean the guy I was talking to didn't like it. John 19, verse 32. People are always trying to disavow the gospel story. 
Well, it can't be true. Because the Bible says not a bone of him was broken. And what about those bones? The Bible said not a bone of him was broken. That means not a bone of him was broken. Not any bone. Anywhere. So, when the soldiers came and broke the leg of the first and the second, when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. But, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. So I studied that out. Medically, it's called pericardium. And what that is, is that your heart starts beating so fast trying to pump the blood, and it's difficult for the blood to pump, that it separates the blood between uh, the thick part of the blood and, and the rest of it turns into water. So when they stabbed Jesus in the side, because he, he literally died of a broken heart. I mean, physically he had pericardium, what the doctors say was pericardium, that separated the thick part of the blood from the liquid part of the blood. And so when they stabbed him in the side, out came blood and water. Okay? And then finally, Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. So I studied this through. I know this. Jesus came from holy seed because he is holy. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. Let each of you look not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. You know what joy, joy is? Jesus over you, J-O-Y. It's also Jesus, then others, then you. And I have found that out, boy, I get real joy. There's times that, you know, I get down, you get down. And I'll go to a rest home or some other place and visit people. And when I see the condition that they're in, others first, not yourself, leave your own problems behind, go minister to others who have problems, you come out of there with joy. You thank God you have two legs to walk with. You thank God that you're not on crutches or in a wheelchair or tied to a bed or anything like that. So Jesus, others, and then you. Amen? Joy. So, in Philippians 2.4, he says, Let, Look not every man on the things of himself, or on his own interest, but also, look every man on the interests of others. Let this mind be in you who was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, Jesus said, It's not robbery for me to be equal with God the Father. Do you want to see a verse that will really open your eyes to that? Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. We all know that verse. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. This is the name of the one who's to be born. The child that's given to us. Listen to his names. His name will be called Wonderful. Counselor. Wait a minute. Isn't that the name of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Think about this. Counselor. Mighty God. Isn't that what they call the Father in the Old Testament? Mighty God? Everlasting Father. And the Prince of Peace. He has such a list of names and I just really feel led to share those with you that was not in my notes but I'm going to do what the Lord told me to do these are all the names of Jesus that I could find in my concordance and I asked God to help me to put it together so we could understand it these are all all the names that I could find of Jesus in scripture okay he is the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the great I am and the Holy One, my Redeemer who came from afar. He is Jesus, my Savior. Indeed, He's the first and last. He's the Lord of all. 
so on him my soul I cast. Jesus is the anointed one. He's even so much more. He's the beginning and the ending. Forever, he's the door. The beloved son, the blessed one, the bishop of my soul. He's the righteous branch and the bread of life. He alone can make me whole. He is the bridegroom and the bright morning star. He's the captain of my salvation. He came from heaven's shore. He's the chief cornerstone and the door for all of God's sheep. He's the chief shepherd and a counselor. He's promised my soul to keep. He's the deliverer, eternal life. He is faithful and he is true. He is the faithful witness, the glorious Lord, my God, my Savior too. He's the good master, the great high priest, and the blessed son, the heir of all things, the holy child, the just and holy one. He's our hope of glory, Emmanuel. Yes, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the King eternal, King of glory, King of all the earth, the Lamb of God, the light of the world. He paid for my second birth. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the living bread. He's the Lord of glory, the Messiah, and the firstborn from the dead. He's the Master, the Most Holy, A mighty God is He. The only begotten of the Father. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the great physician and the power of my God. The resurrection and the life. Righteous judge and He's my rock. He is the Rose of Sharon, my Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the Son of David, the sure foundation, the one who paid my price. Jesus is the true vine, the blessed truth, and the God who makes us free. He is wonderful and counselor. Yes, Jesus is Lord indeed. Amen? That's who he is. Praise God. The Bible goes on to say in Philippians 2.4, he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. Verse, Verse 7 says, he made himself of no reputation. He took on him the form of a bondservant and came in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The worst torture known to man on the earth at that time, the crucifixion. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. All of those names that I just read, his name is above all those names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He came by water and he came by blood. Verses 7 and 8 tells us that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Can we back that up in Scripture? Are there Scriptures that talk about the three being one? Let's take a look. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In Matthew chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me, Matthew 3 starting with verse 16, the Bible says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, there's Jesus, and behold the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. There's the Holy Spirit. And suddenly there was a voice that came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There's the Father. The Son, the Spirit, and the Father. Okay? And then we want to go to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. that says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, God, and the Word was God. 
Now remember Genesis 1.1? God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.2 says that uh, he was the word and all things were made by him and without him nothing was made that was made. So wait a minute. Did God create the heaven and the earth? Or did the word create the heaven and the earth? Or is the word God? And then John chapter 4, verse 24, when Jesus had the discussion with the woman at the well, he told her plain out, God is a spirit. And those who worship him, him, not it, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Then in John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And then in John 14 and verse 7, I believe it's Philip that Jesus is talking to there. In John chapter 14, after he says he's going to heaven to prepare a place for us, it was Thomas. Thomas asked him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, we all know this verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto me except, no man comes unto the Father except through me. So in verse 7 he said, if you had known me, you would know my Father. Also and from now on you know him and you've seen him. Now the only one Thomas saw was Jesus. He said, well from now on you know him and you've seen him. We're the same as what he was saying. And then you look at 1 Timothy 3.16 that talks about great is the mystery of godliness. Now, it's a mystery. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, without argument or without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So, again, the word mystery means a truth that has not been fully revealed. Okay, so... Here's a mystery, the electricity. We flip on switches, but there's not a person here if I gave you a wire, some capacitors, and a few other electronic items that could put together electricity. I went uh, a year and a half to school in the Navy uh, in a basic electricity and electronics course. I still don't understand it. I don't even know how I passed that course. I just know that it works, so I just, I'm content with flipping a switch. So there's some things that are mystery. You just got to believe it. You know, don't try to figure it out. That's what people that are really, really high and mighty in their mind, they got to have every single answer and they got to see it. And that's the world's way. You show me and I'll believe it. God's way is no. You believe it and then I'll show you. So in 1 Timothy 3.16, without argument, great is the mystery of godliness because God was manifested in the flesh how was that? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was justified in the spirit. We just read it where he saw the spirit coming down on him like a dove. He was seen by angels. That's for sure. When Mary went to the tomb, the angel said, he's not here. He's risen. He was preached on among the Gentiles. The apostle Paul wrote several 52% of the New Testament preaching to the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world. We're part of the world and we believed on him. And he was received up into glory. And man, there's two places you can find that. Acts chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians 15. In Acts chapter 1, the Bible says he, he preached to them. And then before their very eyes, he was raised up into the clouds. And they were staring at him being raised up into the clouds. And there were two angels standing by that said, why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus will come again in like manner. And then in 1 Corinthians, the Bible tells us the same thing. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it says, this is the gospel, the death, Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time. And that was when in Acts chapter 1. They all saw him at once when he went up and they were all staring. So there's plenty of physical evidence that Jesus was real. Plenty of physical evidence that he was resurrected. And the last one is 1 John 5.20 that says this. Brethren, we know that we're of God. Do you know that, by the way, tonight? Do you know that you're of God? 
Do you know that you've been born again? Do you know that you're saved? The Bible says we know we're of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. That's 1 John 5, 19. Verse 20 says, And now we know that God has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true and that we are in Him who is true, true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. You can't get any plainer than that. This is the true God and eternal life. We're going to go ahead and close tonight with verse 9. Because the scripture says if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. So somebody had to witness to you. Somebody witnessed to me. We received the witness of men. The witness of God is greater. Numbers 23.19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is the son of man someone who says something and then turns around from what he says. Has he said and shall he not do it? Has he spoken and shall it not come to pass? If God said it, it's going to happen. John chapter 8, if you'll turn there with me. John 8, verses 12 through 19. By the way, uh, again, I just want to point out, in the videos, the notes are down if you click on the title in the videos, all the notes pop up on the YouTube station. The reason I hand out these notes is so that you can hear what God has given me for those scriptures and then take them home and study them yourself and see if God will confirm that to you or even give you more revelation on what he had to say. Because nobody's got a corner on the market. Nobody knows everything. I give you my little 1% of the pie that I know And you need to add whatever God tells you to what you know. Amen. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. John chapter 8 and verse 12. Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If we say as a Christian, I don't know which way to go, ask the light. Amen. He says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. He didn't say, my word is a lamp out there for two miles down the road. No, it's to our feet and to the path. God will show us which way to go. He knows we need to go one step at a time. Amen. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness isn't true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I do bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. You don't know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. Because I am not alone. Because I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself. And the Father who sends me bears witness of me as well. (laughs) One and one is two equals one. (laughs) All right, Hebrews 13.8. I think we all know this one. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. He's the very, very same. I want to thank you for listening tonight. Would you stand with me? We're going to go ahead and close in prayer. Robert, we'll pray as you head down south for your birthday that God will bless you and give you a wonderful birthday, brother. We are glad you're in our family and we wish you a very blessed birthday, brother. And we'll be praying for you as you go down. Amen. Lord, thank you so much for the time we've been able to spend here in your word. Wow, Lord, it seems like every time I share your word, I learn something new. I am just amazed at the wisdom that's in your word. And no wonder, because your word is alive. It's full of power. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It even goes right between my soul and my spirit. And it completely, your word understands the thoughts and intents of my heart. It even goes into my joints and marrow and produces health to my bones. 
So, Father, we want to thank you for the word of God that ministers to us and gives us life. It is our life. You are our life. And we just want to say thank you tonight, Lord, for, for ministering and teaching us. I pray, Lord, as we receive an offering tonight, that you will bless that, that you will use whatever comes in for your glory to bless others. And Lord, I, I also want to lift up the people in Hawaii who have lost their homes, and so far the toll is 89 have lost their lives. We don't know who of those believed in you. But our prayer is, Lord, that you will help us as a church to help them not only financially, but that you will help us to pray for them. For you said to love one another. And Lord, the best way we can love one another is with action. So Lord, we pray for them tonight that you will indeed restore that which the canker worm has stolen and that you would bring many to Christ through this crisis that they're going through. Lord, we said it this morning and we believe it that the closest we've ever been to you is when we were in great trouble, deep sorrow, tribulation, is when we draw close to you. So let those people draw close to you, Lord. And let us who walk in the light be a help to them as well. I pray now, Father, that you will bless this congregation as we take a few minutes to answer questions. But Lord, bless us. Keep us walking forward with you. Help us to be persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor anything high, or anything low, or any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. For we pray it in your precious name. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. You were wounded for our transgression. You were bruised for our iniquity. Punishment that was due for our peace was laid on.